pummeled with tank fire, mortar rounds, riots for bread, women who tried to commit suicide by setting themselves on fire. Many, many women were dying in childbirth. I was kidnapped by Qaddafi's troops. There was no place to hide. So I was 26 uh, the first time I went to Afghanistan. And I had been li living in India at the time. And I had a roommate who went to Afghanistan under the Taliban. And he came back and he said, you know, you're a woman. You should go to Afghanistan and photograph women living under the Taliban because no one's doing it. And uh, he didn't tell me that photography was illegal at the time, that you <laughs> couldn't photograph any living thing, and that there was no American embassy, and that the only governing body was the Taliban, which was ruled by Sharia law. Uh, but I was 26, and I didn't care. And so I went. And I took some pictures of women. I kept my cameras in my bag, and I ran around to people's homes. And I went to the hospitals. This was a woman's hospital in 2000. There was no medicine, very few doctors. This was a woman in labor. This is a very typical scene on the streets of Kabul. This was the capital at the time. There were almost no cars. Women beggars were really the only women you would ever see on the street. Any form of uh, entertainment was illegal. There was no music, uh, no television. Uh, no cell phone. So when I would go to Afghanistan at the time, I would literally fall off the face of the planet. I would have no idea what was happening outside of Afghanistan. This scene happened. Uh, I was out at a refugee camp because there was a drought in Herat, which was western Afghanistan. And I was with my driver. And he said, Madam, I have to go early because my brother is getting married. And I said, great, let's go to your brother's <laughs> wedding. <laughs> So he took me, and I brought one camera, one lens, and I hung out. And I had been on a street, like the, the picture you had just seen. And we descended down these stairs, and the Titanic was blasting. And men and women were dancing together. And this was all under the Taliban in secret. About nine years later, National Geographic assigned me to photograph women in Afghanistan. And I spent about two years photographing. And the changes that had been made were astonishing to me. I had been working pretty much consistently in Afghanistan since 2000. So I went almost every year. And uh, my last trip was about five months ago. This is a wedding. Uh, the man on the right is the father of the groom. And he is a filmmaker in Afghanistan. This is a typical scene of a midwife. This is in Badakhshan province. And that province has very few roads. So many, many women die in childbirth in Afghanistan, mostly because of the lack of access to hospitals and doctors. So what you see here is a, woman, a midwife from Merlin. And she would go out into very remote villages. And they would make an announcement at the mosque. And pregnant women and women with young children would come and meet with her. And after spending about two weeks in Badakhshan province, I was driving back to Faizabad, which was the capital. And I noticed these two women on the side of the mountain. And I said, that's strange. There's no man with those women. And anyone who's worked extensively in Afghanistan knows that there's always a man with a woman. So we stopped the car. And Dr. Ziba, who was my translator and an amazing Afghan woman, she jumped out. And we ran up the mountain. And she said, what's going on? And the woman in, on the right was in labor. And her water had just broken. And they had rented a car. And her husband's first wife had died in childbirth. And he was so determined to not have his second wife die in childbirth that he rented this car. And they were driving from their village to Faizabad, the capital. And their car broke down. And so I said, get in my car, and I'll take you to the hospital. And they said, we can't. We need the permission of her husband. And so I said, Dr. Ziba, go find the husband. And fortunately, there was one road that led throughout the whole province. <laughs> so she took our car, and she found the husband. And they all came in my car, and she delivered. And everyone always asked me if I, took, if I have pictures of her delivering. And I stopped photographing at the point that I left them, uh, that I put them in my car, because I changed the story as a journalist. And I didn't feel like it was ethical to keep photographing. Many women in Afghanistan end up in prison simply for asking for a divorce. 
uh, for uh, doing things that in the West we would see uh, as not justifiable to end up in prison. This is Maida Hall. She was married at a very young age to a man who was decades older than her. He was uh, handicapped, so every day her, her duties as a wife were to bathe him and to take care of him and feed him. Uh, when she was 21, she asked for a divorce, and she was thrown in prison by his brothers. This is a young woman. Uh, women in Afghanistan who are unhappy or who are shamed, they don't take a gun and try and commit suicide the way that we would try to, or that's more typical in the West. They set themselves on fire, and many of those women don't die. So I did a series for the New York Times on women who tried to commit suicide by setting themselves on fire. This young woman had been accused by her neighbors of stealing, and she was so ashamed that she tried to kill herself. And she died a few days after that picture. Um, with the Americans uh, in Afghanistan, one thing they tried to do was train up a police force of women. And this is a, at a shooting range outside of Kabul. Uh, education has really picked up in Kabul. That's something when I first used to go, there were secret girls' schools in people's homes uh, hidden from the Taliban, and now you see women graduating. There's a women's boxing team. Uh, this is uh, a woman in parliament. There are women in parliament, sorry. There are soap operas with women and women actresses. This is a soap opera set in Kabul. This is Trina, she's an actress. She did soap operas and she was also in some movies. So in uh, 2009 and 2010, I accompanied uh, the Marines female engagement teams throughout Helmand province. This was a program started by the Marines to have American women engage Afghan women because many of the Marines, all the Marines operating in Helmand province were men and there was a whole 50% of the society they couldn't uh, they couldn't engage, and they couldn't go into people's homes. So they brought women in, and they had them talk to Afghan women, look at them for basic medical treatment. Um, but it was fascinating for me because I had been embedding with the military for many, many years, but I was always the only woman. So it was the first time that I was able to be around women to go around and see how they operate in this hostile environment. This is a female Black Hawk pilot, Jessie, and she used to go in and pick up the injured. She was working with a medevac team. This is them training. This is all uh, in Helmand province, cleaning their guns, relaxing at night. And it was the first time, you know, usually when I embed with the military, there's no place for me to sleep. It's always this big crisis. Where is the, where is the female journalist going to sleep? And so I finally was able to sleep on a normal cot with a bunch of women, <laughs> which is really fun. <laughs> and I loved seeing them still try and do their makeup and be feminine, even on the front lines. And we patrolled, and we were shot at. And this was before 2013 when women were allowed on the front lines. <laughs> so this is all in 2010. <laughs> I love this picture. <laughs> in 2009, uh, I was given a MacArthur Fellowship, and I wanted to focus on maternal mortality and why women die in childbirth. And so, uh, and it's a body of work that I have been doing now for about five years. And I went to Sierra Leone to photograph uh, in the Magbaraka Government Hospital. It was a place that I knew many, many women were dying in childbirth. And I went there one day and met Mama Sise. She was a woman who was pregnant with twins. She gave birth to the first twin in the village, and the second twin wouldn't come out. So she took a canoe across the river, and there was an ambulance waiting for her across the river, and she drove about four hours across bumpy roads to get to the hospital. And this is when I met her. She had delivered the first baby about 24 hours earlier. She was so scared and tired to push because she, she was just exhausted. And she finally gave birth, and the baby was, I thought, was stillborn. Uh, but the nurses spent about 45 minutes resuscitating the baby. And they have very little there. They don't have traditional machines like we do that can oxygen and everything. They're literally smacking the baby and trying to bring the baby back to life. In that time, Mama Cisse started bleeding, 
Uh, I thought there was something wrong, but I'm not a doctor. I'm just a photojournalist. And so I kept asking, why is she bleeding so much? And they were just mopping up the blood and saying, she's fine. Finally, I went to go get the doctor, and he was in surgery. And when I came back, her blood pressure was down to 60 over 40. They picked her up and carried her across the hospital where the doctor was. There was one doctor in the entire province. And by the time she got there, she died. This is her sister, who was also a midwife, who had arranged to send her that ambulance because she didn't want her to die. This is the mother finding out that her daughter has just died. And this is in the ambulance. And I went home with her body and photographed the ritual surrounding her death and her burial. So two years later, I got a call from Doctors Without Borders, MSF. And they said, we saw the story you did. And since then, we've put five ambulances in Bo province, in this one province next to that province I'd been in. And they offered 24-hour emergency service to women in Sierra Leone in that province. And they gave each of the small clinics in the villages a radio. And so when a woman went into the clinic uh, with complications, they could call for an ambulance. And they said, with that, we've reduced the maternal mortality rate by 60%. Risking our life, so this is an example of risking a life. Some don't survive. Some don't survive at all. They don't survive at all. about maternal health in Sierra Leone. A lot of women die in childbirth here in this country. Yes, it's happening, though we are having this free health. But it's not as due to certain constraints. Because some people are still living a distance. If it's, if it's not MSA, how can people receive transport to receive, to get to a place where the Pelmock Center is or where the clinic is doing delivery. Now you no more I deliver Satan's son. 
Daddy, leave us safe and sound. In 2011, it was February of 2011, and I had watched the Arab Spring unfold from, uh, on TV while I was sitting in Iraq, and then I was in Afghanistan, and then Bahrain, and I was always in the wrong place. And so I called the New York Times, and I said, I'm going to Libya, <laughs> whether you want to send me or not. <laughs> and so I went to Libya, and uh, like most journalists, I crossed illegally from Egypt into eastern Libya. Uh, and that was really the only way to do it because any journalist who wants to cover an uprising, the government generally doesn't want journalists there. So you have to sneak in. So when I got there, it was very euphoric. Uh, people were really celebrating the uprising. A parallel government was being set up. Uh, there were demonstrations. People were really happy. They thought Gaddafi was going to fall quickly. Uh, they called people to fight against Gaddafi's troops. And they were clearly untrained. It was doctors, engineers, teachers, learning how to use weapons. Immigrants were fleeing. People uh, who had gone to Libya to work were trying to get boats out of the country. They felt that the fighting was imminent. And in Benghazi, there was really an air of tension. And about a week after I got there, some rebels started pushing forward towards the front line. And a handful of photographers, it's always the crazy photographers, uh, who go forward. We started moving forward with Gaddafi's troops. Uh, we ended up on the front line. Uh, this is Ras Lanouf. What you see in the background is an oil refinery. And we followed them as cities fell from Gaddafi's hands into rebel hands. They went in. They would shoot out pictures of Gaddafi, go into homes. The fighting was really disproportionate. Gaddafi had a trained military. And we were with the rebels. And so this is an example of we were on the front line. It was one road that sliced through the desert from west to east. And one day we were on the front line when a helicopter gunship came in directly above us and started spraying the ground around us with 50 caliber bullets, like this big. And uh, they had to fight back with Kalashnikov. Some, some of the soldiers, some of the rebels were throwing rocks up into the air. Many times they just turned around and fled when Gaddafi's military approached. Uh, we had been sort of spoiled by being with the American military, the Marines in Afghanistan and Iraq, and it was very different. Uh, this particular day, we were being pummeled with tank fire, mortar rounds, 
we would just follow the front line as it pushed back and forward. We were really trying to get a sense of what was happening, and it was before the no-fly zone was put in place. So as journalists, we really wanted to show what was happening so that uh, while, while the no-fly zone was being deliberated, we can provide a first-hand picture of what was happening on the ground. The rebels were really getting injured and killed around us. The fighting was very, very intense. There was no place to hide. We would be on the front line, and we would hear the hum of an aircraft, and you would literally just hope that it, the bomb didn't land on top of you. Cower and fear, this particular bomb landed about 100, 200 feet from where we were standing. And we pushed forward with them as they took more ground. And several days after the, I took this picture, I was kidnapped by Qaddafi's troops with three other journalists for the New York Times. So that was the last picture in that series. <laughs> Luckily, I had a premonition that something might happen, so I sent a hard drive out with a, f with a colleague and said, if I get taken, uh, please send this to my agency. And that's how I was able to salvage all my pictures. Uh, last year, I wanted to cover what was happening in Syria, but my family begged me not to go into Syria. So I started covering the refugee crisis. And I've made eight trips to the region, to Turkey, Jordan, Lebanon, uh, northern Iraq, and I did go once into Syria. And so this is a collection of photos of the Syrian refugees. These are refugees streaming into northern Iraq. And this is them waiting for handouts in northern Iraq after arriving. This is a food distribution in Zaatari when there were riots for bread. This is a family arriving in Zaatari for the first time. And when they're, they're getting registered with the United Nations in Zaatari. And a family sleeping outside at dawn in Iraq. This is a, um, a funeral for a rebel fighter. And they're cooking. The body was still in Syria, but this is the family cooking. And people were living in caves in Lebanon. I went back to these caves uh, several months ago, and the families have all been moved into makeshift camps. There are no camps in Lebanon because the Lebanese government is, uh, does not want formal camps set up. This is at a bread distribution in Zaatari. And these are the camps on the Syrian side of the border. People were living in raw sewage. Uh, there were no NGOs working there except IHH, a uh, Turkish NGO at the time. And this is in Syria. He was a former uh, fighter, and he was living in a school with his family. And this is uh, outside of a smuggler's village in Turkey. And I was waiting to try and photograph the exodus of refugees coming out of Syria. And it's a picture that's very, very difficult to get as a photographer now, because all of the neighboring countries have really shut down their borders. And uh, so I stood outside of the smuggler's village because I knew that they were crossing there. And every hour or so, someone would come up to me and say, get out of here, we're going to kill you. And one guy came up to me and he said, I'm going to go get my knife. Um, another guy came up to me and said, just wait till dark, because when dark comes, you'll see all the refugees. So I put my cameras in my bag and I waited. And of course, at dark, they all started streaming out. And this is a family living in, uh, in a camp across from a formal camp in Turkey. They were literally living under the trees. And this is that same <coughs> camp. I just wanted to show you a few on assignment pictures, because I think it's funny. This was me in 2001 in Pakistan. This is me in Fallujah, crossing illegally into Darfur to cover the war in Darfur. We had to walk for three kilometers, most of that through wadis. This is, uh, we had lived on the back of this pickup truck for five days, driving through the desert in Darfur. This is the Korangal Valley in Afghanistan. I was embedded with the 173rd. That's me and my colleague in Afghanistan. That's me and that same colleague. <laughs> <laughs> sort of like being an actor. <laughs> and this is us hiding in that silo in Libya on the front line. And this is us on the front line. That's me with Tyler Hicks. Uh, and we were taken together. It's Yuri Kozarev and Nikki Sobeki. And this is uh, an example of where we stayed typically in Libya on the front line. Uh, people, Libyans would just open their homes to journalists who were there. And for example, in this particular house, there were 17 journalists sleeping. And every night, we got a knock on the door at about 6 o'clock. And it was a 10-year-old Libyan boy. And he would come with a giant tray of food and just set it down and leave. 
And so the women who were still in the village would cook for us every night. And on the upper right is Anthony Shadid. He's a colleague. And he died in Syria last year of an asthma attack. And that's it. Thank you.